Our next speaker is uh, Jokia Hermes, uh, the person with the wrong photo in the program. Um, Jokia will present a critique of critical media training uh, and uh, address the challenge of uh, connecting with young people in a world uh, that is increasingly populist and polarized. Um, <coughs> Yoki is a professor of applied research in media culture and citizenship in In Holland University in the Netherlands. She teaches television studies at the University of Amsterdam, uh, has published widely, and is the founder and co-editor of the European Journal of Cultural Studies. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you very much also for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. And, um, I wish I wasn't speaking right after this uh, compressed and wonderful um, well, start, start of the evening, as um, it's almost churlish now to complain about media literacy training. But that is what I, in fact, will be doing. Um, because I, well, my sense is that we're not doing that well in media literacy uh, training. There is, at least in the Netherlands, but I believe elsewhere, to uh, an enormous industry of um, independent professionals giving trainings to parents and teachers. Um, and it, its promise, its Im usually implicit promise is that it'll bring us more citizenship. Uh, citizenship uh, defined as connection, co-ownership, responsibility shared responsibility for the world. Um, it is not apparently, I, or at least I don't see it being um, a, the tool we need today in a world um, that's dominated by populist po uh, politics, um, uh, very polarized societies, um, where work is now sort of the single key to sort of success and social status. Um, what needs to be done is the uptake of the entire paper, and I'll, I'll sort of backtrack to what I'll be saying now, is to find ways and means to meet and talk with young people across the different enclaves that they live their lives in to hear their, to hear their stories. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, when I was about to write this paper, um, I had one of these messages from LinkedIn, you'll be getting the same sort of thing, and this one linked to the, this particular news story in a newspaper I'd never heard of called Desert News. And I'll quote to you um, what Sonia Livingston, one of my connections, um, says here. She says, it's perfectly legitimate for parents to think that something called Peppa Pig is going to be Peppa Pig. London School of Economics online safety expert Sonia Livingston told the BBC. And I think, this is Sonia again, and I think many of them have come to trust YouTube as a way of entertaining your child for a couple of minutes while the parent makes a phone call. I think it, if it wants to be a trusted brand, then parents should know that protection is in place. Well, I still think of Sonia Livingston as a media scholar, but apparently she's now a safety expert. And the world of media also is moved into a very unsafe place where children may well need defense skills rather than citizenship. I checked the Deseret News, uh, which is a Salt Lake City newspaper co-owned by the Church of Latter-day Saints. But it was actually the media channel Vice, according to uh, the Deseret News, who first broke this particular story. And their headline ran, YouTube kills ads on 50,000 channels as advertisers flee over disturbing child content, taking a more political economy approach to the same bottom line that something is very, very wrong with online media. So the desperate news apparently is not um, just another right-wing conservative Christian reactionary reiteration of how dangerous the media are. Vice, provider of hip news for young people, is equally worried. Well, if the two of them, Desperate News and Vice, are lining up, there's more to do and think about for a, critical media, for a critical media scholar than just to ignore the fears of parents or to say that children 
mostly are well able to find their way in media content. Like grown-ups, after all, they're active meaning makers, curators, taste arbiters. I still am deeply convinced that fear offers bad counsel and the parents are overly worried. Most children and youngsters are far more resilient media users and makers than they're given credit for, but a new taking position on young people and media literacy is also in order. And that means, for instance, reading these two news stories against recently published large-scale Dutch studies of young people in the media, um, where it becomes really clear that a quarter century of media education has neither brought citizenship education nor the protection that parents wish for um, as a defense skill for their children now that pigs morph into porn stars. These two studies, um, one, uh, the upper one is by the Dutch Knowledge Net and the other is by a group called Media Wisdom. Um, they both conclude that young people are considerably less media literate than they, so the young people themselves, think they are. Especially when it comes to facts. They're taken in by fake sites, even when these have a professional look and feel. And um, secondly, they don't seem to have learned, or they're not primed more generally, to find corroboration for information, facts, and knowledge they come across. In our own research at In Holland, where we are doing work on intercultural media literacy, there is a third element. Uh, the youngsters we are speaking with have a total disregard for what they call old media in favor of social media. Doubtlessly, social media are a domain more easily owned by young people now that children from a very early age on have smartphones on which they access the internet. Of interest, I think, is the fact that in the process of feeling ownership, there's little recognition that much old media content is, of course, the digitized content of new and social media. So defense skills, media literacy, citizenship, and citizenship defined as co-ownership of the public sphere and democratic institutions, they are related, but not in a straightforward or obvious logic. And while I recognize the urgency of understanding and supporting self-defense skills, I want to propose that we also take a slow route for long-term engagement rather than only for immediate survival. And such a route would include reflection and research and may come to include coming to codes of conduct or means to discuss those. So, on to our intercultural media wisdom project. The goal of the project is to provide professionals and parents with media literacy tools across different backgrounds in terms of education, ethnicity, religion, and so on. And what I want to talk to you about for a bit is uh, the group discussion we had about social media at a place called the Youth Information Point in Amsterdam, Amsterdam North, which is a highly mixed neighborhood in terms of its class, politics, ethnicity, and so on. So these were 15 to roughly 23-year-olds, and there were 18 of them. It was, let's see, where am I at my, oh, sorry, missed an old media slide, never mind. This was a very difficult conversation to have. So there was white middle class us wanting to talk about media in a non-white group. So our informants patiently sat down to wait and see how we were going to handle our privilege, our teacher-like status, if you will. We chose to speak as parents, and they felt that was OK. We asked them, could they offer us suggestions as to how parents and professional could and should help children and young people not to land themselves in trouble via their smartphones. Our reasoning was that mobile phones for most young people are the key to both their media use and their social lives. The coordinator of this particular center told us that her boards tended to conduct a significant part of their lives online via their phones, whether to do with friendship, intimate relationships, sex lives, their finances, contact with school, or for the couple of them who work, their work. By asking for help with our project, rather than for personal information, we hope to not scare them off. They have their reasons to come to a help center, after all, and appealing to lay 
lay expert identities often works well in qualitative research. It also fits our goal of wanting to come to these tools via participant design. While not entirely sure we would correctly understand them, our informants decided to share their social media survival skills. We're working on finding out more about their, sort of get a fuller picture of their media lives, um, vloggers on YouTube, Netflix, preferences, singers, all of that. Um, and we, well, we, we're given incidental references that they do watch old-fashioned media, but this is, this is difficult. We're not allowed on this very private terrain yet. And of course, this was not what we were asking them about. We wanted to help in helping other people. So I also suspect that they think that television is not a danger area. Uh, television does not generate any of the excitement that social media do. Instagram was what they wanted to talk about. They call it Insta, their favorite platform. They were also on and off Snapchat users, but this was a little bit more problematic. <laughs> The main, thing, the main thing I learned was how not to get taken for a ride. Blocking is the general practice. Asking the wrong question, screening a Snapchat picture. Uh, this is when you make a screenshot of um, a, snap, a Snapchat message or picture for future use, not allowing it to disappear. Could be enough to have your phone number blocked or to block a phone number. Our informants' variness of being screened partly stemmed from their own practice. They screened silly pictures of others too, to spread at future appropriate moments, but saw this as par for the course. Less discussed but important is to have a small circle of friends to count on not to spread silly and stupid pictures. So, Elaine, you see how relevant this picture apology you just did was in in my, in my um, um, experience of the media world today. Um, but, so, the researchers of these two larger studies, too, saw many, many pictures where um, young people and children were screening their faces. They thought this was all to do with performativity and creativity. I don't think so, having done this group, this group talk, this group interview. Our impression is that, barring contact with a few really close friends, online social life is really a playing field of the war zone variety. You want to be there because this is where you engage with others, where you date, where you may find friends, but also possible suitors or suitresses who provide crucial social status capital that links offline and online worlds. But others are also a threat they may well betray your confidence. The rules of the game are simple. Once you have a name, as used on Instagram or a phone number, you make contact and you challenge the person of interest to send you a picture, much as they will challenge you to do the same thing. When contacts are made online, whether as introductions through mutual contacts or through apps, your basic survival skill is to assume that the profile picture used for this form of courting has been manipulated. The best strategy when on social media is therefore not to trust any image. Information, not an issue, uh, possibly always seen as untrustworthy. While taken deeply seriously, online social life is most of all a game in which you try to catch out others and um, try to not be embarrassed or shamed yourself. The advice of our inf informants to other young people, therefore, was that they were really best helped when they realized you need to enter this playing field for wound. Better to err on the safe side and block and screen in time than to have trust betrayed and social status damaged. The same challenge and suggestion of exhilaration and fun was in the way our informants counseled the handling of parents, who, of course, see it as their responsibility uh, to make their kids do their homework, go to bed on time, and all of that. And they happily talked about stealing your phone back or fooling your parents while they were on their own phones or engrossed in Netflix series. Well, this piece of advice may have little to do with um, experience of other parenting regimes than strictness, 
It is also an example of understanding social life and relationships as game playing. Such a game frame has a double advantage. Here it works as a means to come to a form of imagined control of real life. Games depend on consenting players on a set of rules and therefore a set of limits regarding time, place and what ends the game. In addition, at any one moment a game player can step outside of the magic circle of the game and stop playing. I don't like this game anymore. Or it was just a game. I was not being serious. Well, I doubt this works really well with an angry parent. A game frame provides a fantasy space that allows for the construction of what will feel like sufficient justification to ignore the message parents are trying to get across to take school seriously, to do your homework, to make an effort. A game frame also fits the liminal status of being an adolescent. No one takes you seriously, so why should you? Young people feel the need well, young people need to find out who they are, invent themselves, if you will, rather than be copies of parents who grew up in a different world in any case. The uncertainties any game is based on, last but not least, also fit the intuition or even knowledge that nothing is ever given or true in the world of social media, where most anything can be fake, false, invented, or a hoax. Social media literacy, knowing when to block screen or avoid screening, echoes the media literacy lessons we found, for instance, in interviews with primary school children, which we did last year. They, are, they too are well aware that they need to shield personal details, not spread silly or nude pictures of themselves and not to trust unknown others. While parents may not be especially in favor of screening, it does in accord also with the ability to stand up for yourself. Blocking, I realized after a group interview, um, sorry, blocking, I realized, was also the exact advice given by one primary school director uh, who said when children encountered bullying, fighting on WhatsApp group, just leave the group, there will be another one. Neither social nor informational skills are a strong part of media literacy children and teenagers encounter in their school lives, it seems. Nor, according to the children, is this something they learn, or s learn from or see their parents do. No one sits down to talk through what, what were felt to be insults or a row or to discuss how these things might also be resolved in dialogue. No one teaches the difference between total distrust and the useful skill of checking information regardless of whether the source is an authority, an unknown, or down, an unknown or downright dodgy. In terms of citizenship education, this is a dire situation. Citizenship, at least to my mind, depends on discussion, conversation, exchange. It needs information and insight in how things stand in the world. It needs claims that are made to be taken seriously and to be checked on. How else might we define? whether explicitly or implicitly, what is the best possible life for the most of us. To be worried about citizenship and media literacy and the engagement of young people in public affairs is hardly new. In a 1999 talk, Michael Schutzen bemoans the unearned knowingness displayed by his children with whom he watches the cartoon series The Simpsons. Both taken aback by and appreciative of The Simpsons' specific brand of satire, Schutzen worries that his children use satire as a shortcut to social criticism without appreciating either the achievement of individuals or the worth of institutions. I empathize with Schutzen, but also with young people today. For them, neither the fear of parents for social media is useful counsel, nor is taking things overly seriously. Schutzen's children's appreciation of satire may well be a form of solutionism, the same is true for blocking and screening, fooling your parents and tongue-in-cheek irony. These are useful tools in the short run, which means that media literacy training geared towards long-term civic engagement needs to start from a cultural studies, uh, sorry, a, a cultural citizenship perspective, rather than implicitly assume it as its end goal. To deconstruct truths, to not trust authorities remains important, without giving in to fear or conspiracy theories. 
but it needs grounding in a shared sense of an ongoing discussion for what is the best possible life, excluding as little, excluding as little people as possible and how to organize that. Irony, satire, and playing games are not just ways of having fun, they are survival strategies. But in terms of citizenship and sustaining democracy, they're not enough. Having a conversation, and probably even more importantly, learning how to listen should be our priorities, also in media literacy training, before any of those most haunted 21st century skills have the faintest chance of accomplishing anything at all. Thank you very much, Joachim, for this interesting presentation.